Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Devine. I'm the Sci-Fi Ontario Branch Executive Counselor that's going to be moderating this session. I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Paresh Gandhi, um, and all of those people that are uh, on the telephone lines. Um, if I could please ask that you mute your telephone lines as to not disrupt. We will be in lecture mode, but please mute your phones regardless. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I would please ask that when you, you're registering for the webinars, that you register individually, even if you're going to be participating in a room with your colleagues. Um, and the next thing I'll ask is that those, if you are in a room with uh, some other colleagues, if in the chat box you could please put the number of people that are in the room with you, we would appreciate it. So our speaker today is Paresh Gandhi. He has been a public health inspector in the Environmental Health Division at Peel Public Health Department since 2008. He earned his Bachelor of Applied Science with Honors in Occupational and Public Health from Ryerson in 2007. Prior to that, Paresh worked as an Environmental Coordinator for Tim Trends Canada Incorporated, where he was instrumental in helping them achieve their ISO 14001 certification. Paresh has extensive knowledge of environmental and quality systems, having earned the designation of Environmental Lead Auditor and Quality Auditor in ISO 14001 and ISO TS16949 systems. Fresh also has a Bachelor's in Environmental Science from the University of Guelph and a Postgraduate Certificate in Environmental Engineering Applications from Conestoga College. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Paresh. We'll do his webinar for about 45 minutes. We'll do questions at the end. Paresh, over to you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, it's afternoon, actually. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Paresh, and I'll be speaking about ciguatera fish poisoning. Just an overview here of the, what's going to be covered today. I'll be talking about the background, a little bit about how it's diagnosed. The case study here we had at Peel, and we'll, then we'll talk about treatment and prevention and management. Ciguatera fish poisoning is caused by consumption of large tropical predatory reef fish. Um, the main source of the toxin is uh, a is uh, Gambier discus toxicus, and it's associated with seaweed sediments and dead coral. The toxin has some unique characteristics. The fish are not affected by the toxin at all. They don't appear spoiled or taste different, and it, the toxin is very heat stable, odorless, colorless. The highest concentration of the toxin is found in the viscera and head of the fish. So these parts of the fish should definitely be avoided. And mode of action in the body is through prolonged opening of sodium potassium channels that cause electrolyte imbalance. The toxin has also some other unique characteristics. It does pass through the placenta and is also sexually transmitted. However, no long-term effects have been observed on fetuses. When you look at the chemical structures of the toxin, uh, there are two main types of cigotoxin. Pacific, which is on the uh, uh, top of your screen, and the Caribbean. Uh, the Pacific uh, cigotoxin is considered to be more potent at 0 .10 watt, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, and the Caribbean toxin has a threshold value of one milligram per kilogram. This slide shows you some of the commonly consumed fish associated with cigotoxin. Kingfish could also be added to this. So altogether, there are up to 400 fish species associated with cigotoxin. This map shows the distribution of the great barracuda, a reef fish. The red shows the increased probability of finding the fish, and the yellow shows a lower probability of finding the fish. Also gives you an idea of where the reefs are and where that microalgae, Gambier, to Gambier discus toxicus, would, would also be found. So as you can see, a lot of reefs around the world are located in this area. This slide uh, briefly shows you the exposure pathway. It's important to note that uh, uh, 
herbivorous fish could also contain the toxin, but they have a, a much less chance of bioaccumulating that toxin. So if you start on the right side here from the microalgae on corals and seaweed, it's consumed by herbivorous fish, then it gets bioconverted to a dangerous form of uh, cigotoxin. Then it's consumed by predatory fish and finally consumed by humans where they're exposed. In terms of global cases, uh, globally it's, it's uh, estimated about 500,000 cases are, are, are occurring annually. However, only 10% are actually reported. In Canada, we have not seen this condition too often. Only 22 cases reported over a 14-year period. In US, 508 cases over a nine-year period, and in China, 397. So it gives you some idea of how often these, uh, this, this condition is being reported. In terms of diagnosing the cigatera fish poisoning in humans, currently there's no, there are no reliable tests for diagnosis in humans. The current standard for, for diagnosis is actually matching the symptoms in the fish with consumption and incubation time. So if you were to look at gold standard in, in, in terms of diagnosis, it would initially be confirmation of the cigatera toxin in the, in the fish consumed uh, and then uh, analysis through laboratory testing. Uh, the numerous individuals consuming the, the same fish showing signs and symptoms, and then obviously matching the incubation period, which has to be consistent. So you're sitting there at your uh, desk as a frontline worker, and oftentimes the phone rings, and you quickly have to uh, determine what the condition could be. Uh, this slide uh, I put in here to show you some sort of a differential diagnosis. Uh, because sometimes it is very difficult to tell if what you're exactly dealing with. Uh, you can, so if you start at the top, you can quickly eliminate shellfish poisoning through interviews. If shellfish, poison, uh, and shellfish and fish were both consumed, it becomes a little bit more difficult. And the symptoms of that are hot and cold, uh, reversal of sensation, tingling, numbness, and the incubation time is two, two to five minutes. Scromboid poisoning has similar symptoms, but it's temperature caused by temperature abuse prior to cooking and incubation time. So that can be used to quickly eliminate scromboid poisoning. And finally, the, the cigatera toxin um, it is the, one of the only ones that has, uh, and NSP are the only ones that, that have temperature reversal symptoms. So as soon as you hear that, you, your, your mind should quickly go to either N NSP or cigatera toxin uh, poisoning. And, uh, you know, again, once you talk to them and you, you determine that they didn't consume any shellfish, your, your mind should quickly go, uh, and, if, and they have consumed fish, you should, you should be able to narrow it down quickly based on, based on some of your interviews. The symptoms, um, acute versus chronic. So initially, the, the symptoms present themselves as gastrointestinal, vomiting and diarrhea, and then also cardiovascular, hypotension and bradycardia, where you could see some people faint um, and have trouble breathing also. The long-term symptoms are neurological, uh, tingling, uh, you know, uh, reversal of, uh, of temperatures where hot feels cold and cold feels hot on the body and just general malaise and itching. They're, they're some of the symptoms that start uh, uh, in, um, after the first 72 hours. The standard method of testing is to do a presence absent test with a bioassay and studying the effects on mice, then moving to a LCMS test. And, and based on the molecular weight, you, you should know where you would see the peaks and that will help you identify the toxin. So here is an example on the right side. I believe this is an example of the Caribbean. Uh, uh, it, 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 this is a total ion chromatogram of a fish sample containing uh, Pacific sugar toxin. So we now move to the case study. So on August 7, Cases were reported to Peel by Etobicoke General Hospital, five patients, three in emergency, 
and two were uh, had to visit general physician. Um, and it was uh, reported to us there was suspected barracuda fish, uh, which was called Sheila in Tamil. So date of consumption was August 4th, and incubation period is roughly three hours. So by the time it was reported to us, it had already been 72 hours. And the symptoms that were, they presented themselves with to the hospital were nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, tingling, and then, uh, you know, the uh, chronic uh, symptoms had started to uh, show themselves, which was the tingling and numbness of fingers and toes. So like I said, the three were in emergency, two in general, uh, we're seeing the general physician. So at this point, blood samples had been done, but the infectious disease specialist uh, was, and was investigating. However, they hadn't uh, concluded anything concrete, and but blood sampling didn't reveal anything as well. So at this point, the owner was contacted um, the same day by phone since he was off-site, and the store was visited, and all remaining barracuda that were on-site were put on hold. There were some language issues with the owner as well. The fish were called Sheila, but it was not clear as to what else they were referring to as Sheila. So we were trying to figure that out, and uh, it, was a, it was a difficult situation, to say the least. The stoner, at this point, the store owner did indicate that one barracuda came in with a box of tinfoil, but it was different than the other barracuda that they normally order. So since there was only one, uh, and that had been sold, we, we, you know, and it was not available for examination. We had a, a difficult time trying to figure out with the language issues um, and not any. other fish being there, what was exactly going on. So these are, this is just uh, what we found in the, in the store. These are just pictures of what they had on site. These are Southern Senate from the Barracuda family as well. Um, and they were put on hold. And the max uh, length is 30 to 60 centimeters. And this, this will become important uh, later on as we'll discuss uh, uh, this uh, more, uh, in more detail. So just keep that number in mind, 30 to 60 centimeters max length. So I'm trying to take you back and uh, trying to show you, this is what the, the operator would have seen in, uh, when, when the shipment arrived. At the bottom are the, the kingfish, and at the top is the great barracuda. So in a box of kingfish, if you can imagine, there was this one large barracuda when the operator opened the box. But all, all he knew was that this, is, this barracuda is bigger than what he normally receives, and it looks slightly different. Otherwise, it's very similar to the Southern Senate we were just looking at. And the store was used to selling the Southern Senate. So at this point, you know, they ha I think they said it's slightly bigger, but we'll go ahead and just sell it. The max length of the great barracuda is 200 centimeters. So much bigger. So that obviously gives it a chance to accumulate much more toxins. So at this point, you were trying to, uh, we were able to get a hold of the, the complainant, uh, and uh, a sample was taken from their home. Uh, we also received uh, shipping invoices via fax from the shop owner, and uh, we, we were able to determine that the client had purchased the top half of the fish sorry, the bottom half of the fish, from the, mid, from the tail to the mid portion. And that's a picture of what, what was in, remaining in their freezer. And as you can see, it's very difficult to tell uh, anything from that, from that sample, even what kind of fish that could have been. So, so on August 9th, We visited the site again with the CFA, CFA, 
CFI inspector and uh, we put 10 uh, fish on hold, uh, which included kingfish and, and some of the barracuda. And CFI was still trying to decide at this point whether they will test uh, the sample for ciguatera toxin. And they were also uncertain if traceback could be done. Since there was only one fish, they said we don't know where that sample would have uh, come from and how far back they could take that up the line. They weren't sure at that point. So the frozen leftover sample from the complainant's house was provided to CFI along with the shipping invoices and one of the food histories. So on August 14th, CFI was still trying to determine whether the lab was, would be able to test the sample that we had received. We, at this point, we were trying to do some work at our health unit, so we, I found out that no other complaints had been received either by the importer or the distributor. And also, I, I, I surveyed the PHIs in trying to determine if anybody else had received any complaints of fish-related illnesses, and, and they had, hadn't. At this point, Peel received confirmation that uh, the complainant sample will be tested, at, uh, and we got that information at the end of the day from CFI. So fast forward to um, August 28th, uh, Peel Health was still waiting to hear back from CFI regarding toxin analysis. But what they were able to tell us at this point was that uh, DNA analysis was done on that sample from the, that was frozen and provided uh, to them, and they, they were able to confirm it that it was the great barracuda that was sold to the complainant. And as soon as that happened the next day, we, our second set of cases uh, came through from the Environmental Health Contact Center after ours. This time it was a family of five that had eaten the other half of the fish. Um, the date of consumption was uh, August uh, 19th. Incubation time again, three to four hours. They had discarded all of the fish. So the cooked fish was discarded and I believe they had cooked all of it so no raw was available for testing. The fish had been purchased on August 1st and, uh, 1st and had been sitting in their, in their um, freezer until that time. Now, you, because they consume the top half, you can see some of the symptoms that we'll, we will see here are much more severe. One case fainted due to hypotension, also had difficulty breathing, and they had uh, similar sensations uh, such as burning and tingling of the tongue, joint pain in lower extremities, and then cool breeze creates burning sensation. And as soon as we heard that, we, we knew that you know, these two things, set of cases were, might be related. They also had diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, uh, as in all other um, FBIs. So off we went uh, to, the, to the store again, and at this time, um, you know, whatever barracuda he had in the, fa uh, in the store, again, were, were put, on, put on hold. There are approximately 26 species of barracuda, and the, the only uh, type that this store was receiving was uh, the Southern Senate, as, as we mentioned earlier. <clears throat> So the fish shop was again visited with a CFI inspector and more fish were put on hold as a precaution. We interviewed the rest of the cases and then were cases were asked to go see their family doctors because the symptoms were persisting. We also dropped off some stool kits at this point because we wanted to rule out, make sure that we had ruled out all, any other uh, FBIs. So on September 4th, um, it was determined, uh, and we were given this information by uh, CFI, that uh, the great barracuda is not imported by the importer. Uh, that was an accidental shipment. Somehow it got into with, with, with the rest of the ship, with the fish, and the supplier does uh, not ship the great barracuda either. So it's not imported by anybody, it's not distributed, and the supplier doesn't ship it as well. So. CFI at this point was informed of uh, symptoms from the second set of uh, uh, outbreak cases and that no food samples were available for testing. So on September 5th, the uh, 
the names of the suppliers were released to Peel Health after CFIA's investigation, and they were able to tell us that the shipment originated in the uh, southern United States uh, and uh, most likely Florida, which is also a hub where they receive a lot more fish from a lot of other uh, places. So uh, they they were unsure exactly what where the location was where that fish would have been caught. So on, on September 13, Family Doctor of second, second Set of Cases follows up with Peel, saying the, 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 um, the, um, the client, the, the, his clients are complaining uh, that their symptoms are not, are not going away, and he's, he was unsure as to how to proceed with treatment. So at this point, uh, I forwarded them to the MOH for assistance. Uh, something interesting happened here along the way that the a family doctor of the first set of cases worked at the same clinic as, with the family doctor with the second set, and at some point they were having a conversation and they realized that both of their patients had the same set of conditions. So we referred both of those cases to uh, a tropical disease specialist in Toronto. So on September 19th, uh, we got a call back from CFI saying the analysis was complete, uh, no quantitative result was available, and that the sample was suspect positive Caribbean cigotoxin. And once we received this result, we called CFI back to discuss what it meant, what suspect positive of Caribbean uh, cigotoxin meant, and we were forwarded to the uh, National Lab in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, to discuss the results. So this is a, a, a synopsis of the discussion I had with the, the lab manager there. And basically I was uh, told that cigotera toxin is not, uh, uh, testing is not, co uh, not common in Canada. Few labs actually worldwide ha has, have the cap capability to do this testing, including Canada, US, and Australia. And in order to do the testing, they need a purified version of the actual toxin for instrument calibration which they did not have. So the suspect positive Caribbean uh, CTX was based on manual inputs of mole molecular weights, like, we, like, like that slide I showed you earlier, and uh, basically that's how they, they came to the conclusion it was a Caribbean CTX. So on a, we're now in October at this point, and um, um, the US FDA lab at this point had Caribbean CTX, which the Canada was trying to obtain, but it, they were not able to obtain from them. Uh, I think it was because of the lack of availability on the US side as well and the high cost. Um, and some interesting things happened here along the way. At some point, you know, they, I believe they talked to a lab in Alabama who agreed to do the testing. So they, they would just have to ship the sample there, which, which, uh, which they did from the Canadian lab. Um, and again, you know, at this point, we, we had a bit of bad luck. Uh, if you recall back in 2013, uh, the lab uh, in the U.S. were affected by the U.S. federal government shutdown. So again, the, the sample had been shipped. Uh, 300 grams of uh, the Great Barracuda had been submitted to them, except the labs were closed now. And then from October 1st to October 16th, no lab work or any, any government work was being done. So we ran into another, another issue here. Um, in each time there's a test done, they require approximately 10 grams of the sample, and it usually takes five, or five to 10 days to run all the tests. Now, now we were in January 2014, um, and Peel Health uh, received confirmation from CFIA National Lab that the, that the US FDA lab was able to confirm the result uh, that they had on, on the Canadian side with the positive Caribbean CTX finding. No quantitative analysis was done uh, due to the cost and time, um, and that the materials that we were informed used for the testing were upwards of 10,000 for one milligram of, of the substance. So even the US side, uh, I, I believe they did, did run some tests and confirmed the Canadian finding, but they weren't able to give us an exact quantitative result.
So just to go over uh, what happened along the way, this is a summary of, of testing dates. August 9th, sample provided to CFIA. On the 14th of 2013, sample was shipped to Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Then on the 22nd, we received uh, uh, we uh, received information that toxin testing would, will begin after DNA ID had been done. And then in September 19 of 2013, the analysis was complete with no quantitative information except that it was suspect positive for Caribbean cigatoxin. And then again in January 2014, USFDA lab confirmed that result. So we now move into treatment. Um, there is no actual antidote or direct treatment method for CFT. There's only supportive treatment which exists and uh, one of the things that has been most studied and shown to be most effective is, is mannitol. And if, if provided within the first 72 hours, it, it has been uh, shown to uh, prevent chronic symptoms, which are the most severe. However, mannitol itself has some other issues. It can be given if there's diarrhea and vomiting still present. And uh, some of the other things that have also been tried and have shown to have some uh, success is uh, activated charcoal, which has been used to absorb excess toxin from, from the body. And uh, atropine has been used to treat uh, respiratory issues like bradycardia. When we talk about uh, uh, prevention um, and what, what, what steps you know, public health can take, I think uh, we need to start with, with education. Education of not only the recreational fishermen uh, in areas where they, where they might be traveling and fishing. Uh, so if they're leaving Canada and going to places where they might be fishing themselves or they might be going on, sh on, on tours with commercial fishermen, most of the commercial fishermen know where the, the areas are, um, except we, I think, I believe we also need to, you know, make sure that the consumers who are going to be eating some of these fish are aware of, of the risk, and I believe a lot of them do not. You know, we, we could also talk to the local, sh local fish shops here because I, I believe they were not aware. Had, had they known uh, that a, a bigger fish can have a much higher toxin load, I believe they, they wouldn't have sold that, that much, much bigger uh, barracuda. So I think we could have uh, saved ourselves a, a lot of problems along the way. Uh, even even uh, for uh, travelers who, who go to a vaccination clinic here in Canada, I, I think if you provided information uh, through brochures that if, of what cigatera is, how they could be exposed, I think, I think we'd be doing a great uh, service for uh, Canadians. Some of the things that, you know, we need to let people know is, is try to avoid head and, head and visceral of all fish, um, especially reef fish, because that's where the highest toxin load will be. And an interesting uh, fact from the U.S. is 79% of all cases in the U.S. are actually from sport fishing. So it, it seems to uh, uh, look like commercial fishermen and, uh, and uh, more uh, seasoned fishermen know what they're doing. It's, it's the recreational fishermen who, who end up sport fishing on their own uh, are the ones getting into trouble. Um, in terms of uh, testing in fish on site, uh, there's not much available. Uh, Sigua check uh, was, was being tested, uh, but uh, it's no longer being tried out. Uh, Sigo check basically works on a strip test method. You make an incision in the in the back of the fish that you, you've caught. You you uh, take a sample and, and then you do a strip test. And basically, I believe the intensity of the strip tells you the amount of toxin that's in that fish. So sometimes, so it is subject to variability because depending on who's looking at that strip, they may believe that it's it's uh, it's severe or not. So th those were some of the issues. Since, since that, that point, SigwaCheck actually has been pulled off the market uh, because it only has a six month uh, uh, expiry date and after which it's not effective. So there was a lot of problems with SigwaCheck. Uh, when I initially created a lot of, the, of these slides, uh, it was being tested by the FDA, but I, I believe it, it no longer is. There, there are similar uh, once being tested by the FDA, uh, however, nothing has been approved by the FDA at this point for testing on site. 
when we talk about how countries manage uh, their citizens uh, from being exposed to CFP, you know, in, in UE, um, EU, fishery products containing biotoxins cannot be offered for sale. They have a blanket statement. However, it's difficult to uh, decide how they actually uh, determine that. Uh, in US, FDA has proposed guideline levels of 0.1 micrograms per kilogram for Caribbean and 0.01 um, grams per kilogram for uh, Pacific uh, cigotoxin. Global, globally, how, how uh, it's being controlled is basically to avoid fishing in areas uh, where there's reef fish. Uh, a lot of the uh, commercial fishermen knows just know just by uh, uh, working there long periods of time which areas to avoid. And then some countries, what they're doing is just putting a ban on certain types of fish altogether. Uh, or a ban on the size of the fish you can you can catch and, and import and ship. So this is how Canada is actually dealing with the issue. It puts the onus, uh, it's basically a HACCP system, and it puts the owners, onus on suppliers to, to provide documentation as to where the, the fish were caught and provide uh, information regarding the safety of the fish. And, and size is, uh, again, another way Canada is controlling uh, exposing its citizens to CFP. And the sale of barracuda altogether is, is banned in Miami. So these, these are some of the ways uh, different countries are, are dealing with it. And, and weight-based uh, bans have been successful in Cuba. So Cuba has, a, has had a long history of dealing with this, uh, with CFP, and they've been quite successful. So what are the challenges for public health? Well, at this point, there's no analytical standard in Canada for interpretation of, of results. Um, no human biomarkers for diagnostic purposes. Uh, the, you know, no FDA-approved commercial test kit, I think that would go a long way in helping detect toxins on-site and, and providing consumers the right information. And also the fact that obviously purified PTX is, is so expensive and not widely available for instrument calibration and research. Had we had, had that, we, we could have gotten a, uh, a number which told us the amount of toxin that was pr present in, in the fish that, that had been sent for testing. I think medical staff themselves need to recognize signs and symptoms, especially uh, if people in, uh, in non-tropical countries present themselves with this condition. So in Canada, I think you know more could be done in trying to deal with doctors and, and physicians to provide the information how to deal with this. It, because people, because we're catching more and more fish and they're coming from a lot of different areas from around the world now, and we have a, a large ethnic community in Peel, I think that consumes a wide variety of fish. We, we need to make sure that the consumers, uh, the doctors, and they're all, they're all aware of, of what symptoms might present and how to quickly get, get treatment. And you know, one of the biggest uh, things affecting CFP is obviously climate change. So anything that can uh, affect the, the the delicate balance of a of a coral reef and its its uh, it, and how it survives. Uh, so if a, a hurricane passes through and if uh, and all of these things that disturb a coral reef and that cause may cause it to bleach out will cause uh, the the, the the, the, the organism that produces the toxin to proliferate. So, and again, we're seeing increasing travel, Canadians, and not just Canadians, globally, we're seeing increasing travel to a lot of tropical countries. So we need to be aware of that and obviously inform these people that they could be exposing themselves of, of, of CFT by consuming fish that, that, that are predatory or if they don't know where the fish came from. And then the increased importation of fish, like I said earlier. So these these three in combination are are are, are problem. And I think a lot more could be done by by public health to, to make sure that we we inform inform the public at, at all three levels to make sure we reduce um, exposure of uh, of CFP to to to, to citizens. Here are my references that I used um, for the uh, um, for the paper. Um, at this point, uh, I think if, if you have any questions, I'll take them.
Thanks, Presh. This is Eric. I want, I want to thank you for your presentation. It was excellent. And before we move into the, uh, the questions from those folks on the line, um, I just wanted to make a comment that, one, I found that, uh, uh, as you alluded to, reef fish uh, native distribution in that map that you provided in the beginning, um, it does move up the eastern seaboard. Um, but in addition to that, you made two very good comments about food globalization and uh, the, the demographics of the population that we may see this. Um, I wouldn't expect to, to see one of these cases previous to this um, without some of this uh, information. And the second thing that I wanted to mention was that, once again, um, your case study and your investigation highlights that uh, public health investigations are not simple. Um, they're quite complex and they can often involve uh, many other agencies. Some of the ones that you mentioned were the FDA lab in the United States, um, the CFIA National Lab, and the lab in Nova Scotia. So there's a lot of uh, communication and work over the telephone um, to a lot of our public health colleagues that are not right next door to you, and I find that fascinating. Um, so at this point, I think that we'll turn it over to the folks online to see if anyone has a comment or question uh, for Parash. Thank you, Eric. As a reminder for those folks that uh, because we are in lecture mode, um, you do need to type your question into the chat box at the bottom of the page. So we've had a question here. Uh, if I'll be able to provide the, uh, the presentation uh, slides. Uh, yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, I'll, I'll uh, just give me a couple of days, and I, I should be able to send it out to everybody. And Paresh, I did respond to that uh, for Sci-Fi Ontario. Um, we do post a recording of the presentation on our YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Um, it just takes a couple of days for us to get that uploaded, but once it's available, we'll post a note on our website. The Sci-Fi Ontario YouTube channel is accessible through the Sci-Fi Ontario uh, homepage. And uh, last month's presentation on uh, the raccoon response to rabies in Hamilton is currently on the YouTube channel, and you can access, access it through the homepage or on the Sci-Fi Ontario Knowledge Center um, through the Disease and Injury tab. But uh, Ian, Ian has a question about uh, um, if you could provide more in information on the outcome of these patients. Um, yeah. Follow so, up that you did. Um, once, once we transferred them to uh, Toronto uh, 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 Tropical uh, Infection Control Specialist, we, we lost uh, a little bit of contact with the patient. But uh, one of the things that happens is uh, because they were all out of the area where they could be uh, treated uh, for, to prevent chronic symptoms, I think at that point what was provided to them was probably uh, um, uh, mannitol to just to get rid get rid of rest of the toxin out of out of the system, uh, and any sort of other supportive therapy uh, to decrease their symptoms. Um, one of the things uh, people need to be very careful about is um, uh, once you get CFP, it kind of stays with you the rest of your life. Uh, so even if you believe you've you've cured it and it's gone out of your system, the next time you consume reef fish and are, are exposed to toxin, it, it could it could uh, be even more severe. So it's kind of like an allergic reaction. Um, and some of the, the, uh, the information I read was uh, uh, during the, the, the period where the symptoms are lasting, you, you have to avoid, avoid alcohol, um, 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 alcohol, uh, uh, all, all sorts of nuts, because they could, exact, uh, they could make the situation much, much worse. Um, and obviously, you would have to uh, also ensure that uh, you're not sexually active because you could also, uh, or, or you're taking proper uh, precautions because you could also transfer it to other people. So uh, it is it is a, a very uh, a severe condition that that people may have to live with for the rest of their life, and that may that may mean um, avoiding avoiding reef fish altogether. Just so they don't risk exposing themselves to any amount of toxin that might be in that fish, because symptoms could, could easily reoccur. 
Thanks. Question from Andrea. Um, she's curious how the CFIA plans to proceed um, in the future with uh, fish import imports. I we we did not get any information from from CFIA as to what steps they would be taking with regards to what what had happened. I I actually do believe um, what the steps they have in place are uh, to protect Canadians are are very secure. We we they they still don't know how that one one fish got into that shipment because if you we check the rest of the fish there was there was no there was no issues. So um, I think um, they obviously they need to be more vigilant to make sure that not e not even one fish gets through. But I, I believe it could have been human error along the way, or or it's hard to say. Uh, I I think they might have done their own investigation at that point, but they did not let us know what what further steps they were going to take to make make sure this doesn't happen again. Hey, Paresh, I have a question that I'm going to tag into Steve's question as well. Um, and, and the first part of it is mine. If you could describe how the hospital made the initial epi connection and came to contact public health. Um, and then the second part of that is, as a result, do you think that cases are being underreported? Oh, yeah. Let me, let me start off with that. I, I think cases are, are, are definitely being underreported. Um, I, I, I don't know if I can speak, uh, I, I know globally cases are especially being underreported. In Canada, we, we don't see that many cases because uh, of the specific kind of fish that, that people have been consuming here, and, and maybe that's why. But also, I think Canada does a pretty good job in, in, in making sure that the, the fish sent out are, are certain size so that the toxin does are, are is below a certain limit, which so it doesn't have an effect on the human on the human body and the system. Um, how I, I think I think they did a pretty good job, at, at, you know, at the hospital in tr quickly determining that that all of those people had 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 a common meal, so they knew it was food related, and that's how they they and and you know within three to four hours of eating that meal. Uh, that they all got sick. So that's how they, they all got sent to public health. They didn't know any, you know, the hospital didn't know anything more than that. Um, and, and at that point, that's when we, we took over in trying to determine uh, what it could have been. And, and, you know, as soon as I heard the hot and cold reversal, like, and we did some checking on our end, what it could have been, and we knew they had had a, had a common meal, it was fish. Uh, we kind of quickly narrowed it down to cigatera fish poisoning at that point. So that's that's how it all came together. Um, it, it would have been um, nice uh, if we could have been ahead of it a little bit and we could have expo uh, prevented exposure of the second set of cases. Uh, but we had no we had no way of contacting uh, anybody, and we we didn't really know uh, you know if if, if that. Who, who the second half of the fish was was sold to, um, and they had both been sold before before we got there, even for the initial investigation. So that that's where some of the issues we faced dealing with this investigation. Paresh, was a recall issued locally or by the CFA in this case study? Um, I I don't believe uh, there was a recall issued by CFA because it was. It was a. It was a one. They believed it was a one-off, and I think that's why they decided. And I think they tested some of the, the other fish they got from that store, the kingfish, and some of the other barracuda. Um, and so I, I think, based on that, I, I think they didn't do a recall. Thanks, Prish. Steve has a follow-up question and is curious whether. Um, there will be any additional surveillance done by CFIA to ensure that this uh, doesn't happen again. Uh, I I haven't uh, touched base with CFIA since that time. It, it would be it would be um, a good idea to to talk to some of my contacts there and to see if if, if anything more came out of uh, any further uh, strengthening of the rules or tightening of of, uh, of uh, how fish get to the the stores uh, in terms of if they did anything further. Uh, I I haven't. It, that's something I, I could definitely follow up on and try to find out uh, for our group here to see if, if any further actions have been taken by CFI to, to make sure this doesn't happen again. 
again, uh, if you look back at the, the, the history, I think I said 22 reported cases over, over a long period of time in Canada. So I think it, when people do get exposure, it, it's so minor that it, it, it might be uh, self-limiting. So a lot of people might not even go to the hospital. So again, the, 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 the size of the fish, the amount of toxin, and uh, if they are able to quickly recover, then you know, a lot of people don't even bother going to the hospital or, or reporting it. So those might be some of the, the reasons why Canadian numbers might be low. Or it might be that people are simply not being exposed to uh, um, as many fish here in, in, in Canada that, that have this problem. Janine was thinking at the same time that you were saying it and uh, was curious about the 22 cases that you mentioned in Canada over the last 14 years. Um, does that include these cases or is it 14 plus your cases? No, it, it's, it's 14, 14 plus my cases. Yeah, definitely. So this this information was was borrowed from uh, from literature, uh, and it was really actually difficult to find uh, literature for for Canadian uh, information and Canadian epidemiology and as to you know how many you know case, so th there was very few stats on on cigatera that was that were in Canada. So uh, I ended up using a lot of U.S. But I was able to find this one that said there have been 22 cases in Canada in the last 14 years. So. So you you would add on the cases I, I had uh, since since that time to that number. Thanks, Prish. I'm just going to give everyone on the line uh, an opportunity to uh, phrase any uh, last questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and while we're doing that, I'm going to put a plug in for the Sci-Fi Ontario webinar series uh, occurs on the second Wednesday of every month. So we do have another uh, webinar coming up on November 9th. Uh, that's a Wednesday at 12 o'clock, where Ian Young is uh, presenting his topic, I Don't Lose Any Sleep Over It, Understanding the Barriers and Facilitators to Consumer Safe Food Handling. Um, you can register for this event on the Public Health Ontario uh, website once it's posted. It's not currently up, but it will be up next week. Um, so I'll give this last opportunity. Are there any more questions from the web is so, here. So I think there's just a second half of Janine's question. Is there any, are there any other further information uh, available for coastal regions? Um, I, a lot of the information I found was U.S.-based uh, in terms of education posters. I, I, the one I used in my presentation was, was from Florida. So I, I haven't um, seen a lot of uh, education uh, being developed, and I think uh, maybe that's something CFI should be uh, should be doing and working on. So they, you know, they, they target their 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 distributors and their importers. Uh, so you have all of these multi, uh, multi barrier approach, so that you know, not only are you educating consumers, but also uh, ensuring that uh, along the way, if anybody comes across fish that looks suspect, that they don't sell it. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to. It seems it seems like um, uh, it, yeah, it's a dollars situation, uh, Steve. And and I, I do believe like if you look at it in terms of uh, all the other uh, issues CFI has to deal with, I, I would I would think this is not high up on their list. And and so and one of the ways they 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 manage it is to is to again ensure that that their HACCP systems are in place, which they are. So. I don't know if they'll be developing further tools. Um, I, I actually do wish that they did, especially for, for traveling Canadians, because they might not be exposed here, but if you look at how many Canadians go to Cuba, uh, uh, Florida, uh, and in any of those Caribbean places, it's very easily they could be exposed to these, um, these conditions. Okay, thanks, Paresh. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any more questions at this point. I'll give people another minute to phrase any of those. Um, but it, uh, Laurie at Simcoe is asking me to put a plug in that for those PHIs out there that have not filled out the needs assessment survey, uh, please do that. It does close on Friday. The needs assessment survey is being used by Sci-Fi Ontario and Public Health Ontario to target some of the future webinars that you might want to see. So if there's a particular topic that you're interested in, um, please do go and fill out the needs assessment survey. Um, Sci-Fi Ontario is committed to providing 
PHIs with additional educational resources. Um, they do count for professional development hours uh, for the CPC program. Um, when you do register, please do register individually so that we can get track the number